This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office podcast from My Campaign Coach. I hope you all are having a great week and absolutely making things happen out of the campaign trail. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe and review the podcast. It's by far the best way to help get out the word about what we're doing, and I'd personally greatly appreciate it. Now, before we get started with Representative Matt Rinaldi, I want to thank Campaign Sidekick for supporting this podcast. Visit campaignsidekick.vote to find out how their best-in-breed voter contact platform can revolutionize your campaign and help you win. In addition to establishing a nationwide client base, Sidekick was named by the Republican National Committee as one of their five approved and tested voter contact platforms. Definitely something y'all should check out for your ground game. Texas State Representative Matt Rinaldi has represented the northwest portion of Dallas County since he was elected in late 2014. Now, he lost his first race, changed his campaign strategy, and came back to beat the incumbent in a rematch the following cycle. That was even though his opponent spent over $1 million. Matt earned a bachelor's in economics from the James Madison University and his law degree from Boston University School of Law. Like myself, he married well out of his league, and they were blessed by the addition of young Benjamin Rush Rinaldi to their family around the same time that my son Stoney was born. Representative Rinaldi is a trusted source on constitutional issues and has spoken extensively on these matters throughout the state and on Fox News radio affiliates throughout the country. He's a strong advocate for limited government, pro-liberty and free market policies, secure borders, education, Second Amendment rights, and the protection of life. Matt's a good friend of mine and a former client. Let's bring him on. Representative, thanks for joining us here on the podcast. Thank you for having me. And we've known each other for a good number of years now. I think uh, maybe since 2012 or something like that. And you got elected at 14, and you've been doing awesome work in the State House ever since. And it's... uh, you know, I've been doing the podcast for a year and a half. I can't believe I'm I'm just now recently got around to invite you on. <laughs> That's a terrible well, oversight on my it. part. <laughs> well, it's good to have you. Um, now, you, like me, you've recently uh, become a father. You got a little one. You got uh, Rush is his name, right? Yes, and Benjamin he, Rush Rinaldi. I love it. Back to the uh, the founding fathers. And uh, is he? He's about six months, seven months. He's six months old. Yep. That's awesome. Pretty much same age as uh, my little Stony. And uh, so we're, we're going to, we were just chatting offline a little bit about the fatherhood and the, the fun of that. And uh, I tell you what, if there's one, if there's one big hero in all this, it's our wives. Cause they are, they are rock stars and it's yeah. uh, God, God bless them. I know. Seriously. <laughs> oh, I, I cannot believe the amount of uh, her, the lack of sleep and the hard work they do every day. So God bless all the moms out there. <laughs> every yes, every day should be mother's day. Every time I see a single mother on the campaign trail oh. now, I just give them a big hug. <laughs> Amen to that, man. Yeah, I was talking to my wife not too long ago about, she, she's like, I don't understand. I have a hard time sometimes believing that I'm able to do all this. And she's like, then I remember that I have a husband and family and support and I don't have to work. And she's like, just God bless the moms out there that don't have you know all those all those blessings. But yes. Let's uh. So I want to I want to find out more about your backstory. So I you obviously know some of it from from knowing you for a number of years, but walk me through kind of your background and how you got involved in politics and what kind of brought you up to to run for office back in fourteen. Um, well, I, I originally ran for office in twenty twelve. I'd mm-hmm. always been interested in politics uh, since. Gosh, I can remember watching Jimmy Carter uh, give presidential speeches uh, when I was a little kid, like four or five years old. Um, And I remember following the first election I really followed was the 84 election when Ronald Reagan won. Um, So I'd always been interested in politics. I was an activist um, in college. And when the 1994 Republican sweep happened, people don't often realize that Republicans hadn't controlled uh, the legislature um, you know, since I I think it was the 40s before that or the 30s. So, you know, it it was it was a time of hope. And then when we when we took both houses of the legislature, um, they didn't really deliver on their campaign promises. Um, So, you know, it was frustrating. And then that uh, that made me want to get into politics. And and my theory was, you know, if Republicans get in office, do what they say they're going to do. The economy is going to flourish. We're going to create jobs and 
um, you know, the, the, the country is going to be better off for it. And that's the way you win re-election, not by doing what, you know, some of the, the people in Washington were doing. So I ended up running for office in 2012. I got beat because uh, I didn't campaign the right way. <laughs> ran again. And ran. So I ran for an open seat in 2012. Then the guy who beat me was an incumbent. I ran against him again and was drastically outspent the second time. I had everything against me and I won. So apparently the changes I've made worked. So, um, and then one a, another term uh, running in a primary against the same guy two years ago. Man, yeah. Well, th- that was that was a pattern that a lot of our guys had with Matt Krause and others that had you know, run once they lost. I actually remember the first the first time I met Matt, he came through at a training event that I did, and myself, my boss at the time, because Matt was looking to run against Kay Granger for her congressional seat, and we told him, well, Matt, a couple things. One, uh, you need to run for state house, not Congress. Uh, so that's you know number one, you know balloon pop. Number two, you're run for state house and you're going to lose, <laughs> and then you're going to run again and you're going to win. And I'm sure. really not sure why he talked to me again after that because that's that's popping a lot of balloons at once. But that's exactly how it played out. And I definitely, I think there's some great lessons that you can you can share with the listeners about you know what changed in your outlook. Um, you know, let's start out. One of the questions that I always like to ask people, and and knowing your bride and and how involved she is with with you and your your political life, as well as you know, helping you just as a man. Well, let's. Uh, one of the questions that I always ask candidates is, you know, is your spouse on board? And because I won't work much like Luke Macias, who's done a lot of work with you. You know, we won't work with anybody whose spouse isn't on board. And and that's not just in a okay, sure. We want to make sure that whatever their level of involvement or what it looks like on the outside, that that emotionally, sp- spiritually, physically, that they're they're part of that and you're doing it together. Talk a little bit about how that developed your passion and interest in running for office developed with you and your bride and, and how you guys talked about that and really came up with the decision to run in 12. <laughs> well, she uh, when she married me, she knew what she was getting into because <laughs> I had warned her about it. So that was part of the. That was part of, uh, you know, when we met, what she knew, what I had aspired to and wanted to do in the future. And uh, to yeah. be honest, it was uh, in 2009 when the economy crashed, um, you know, it was it was lawyers that were eighth year, seventh, eighth year lawyers and big firms just got butchered. So, you know, we got a. Uh, I, I ended up getting laid off because of the the economic downturn. It was a tough time, and, and I figured he had some time, so I ran for a judge, uh, Republican ticket in Dallas County, which is basically a suicide mission. But you know, it got us to meet so many new people. Um, you know, even though it was a losing campaign, we we knew it probably was going to be. Um, and you know, she got involved in that. We didn't know anybody at first, and then we just knew everybody. And then I ran in 2012 and was favored. Um, I talked to her about it. I always wanted to run for state house. Uh, she was on board because she knew it was it was something that I had wanted to do. Um, so she was very supportive of it. And we we block walked some. We didn't block walk enough in the open seat, uh, which is which is why we ended up losing despite having equal amounts of money. And then in 2014, we ran again, and I just said I was just going to block walk. And that was it. That was the part I liked the best. It was the part I, part I could get myself up to do. So we did that and ended up getting out, spent 10 to 1 and ended up winning. And my wife walked almost as many doors as I did, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I feel like that's one of those things that uh, the preachers for possible potential or uh, political candidates should just insert that in the vows, you know, to have it to hold in primaries and generals and <laughs> just have the election <laughs> side just kind of wrapped up there in the vows. Because in your case, <laughs> that was that was implicit. I like that. Except that was she would about. she would get gifts when she would like <laughs> block walk. I have no idea what it, like she would block walk and come back with potted plants, homemade <laughs> salsa. That's I have awesome. no idea what she was doing in there. One time she was actually helping somebody put up their drapes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was so by the time it was uh, election day, half the people would come up and say, you know, you came to my door. Half the people would come up and say, your wife came to my door. So, That's great. Well, you know, the, the, the candidate getting out there in, in most cases, block walking is the best possible thing. And, and the spouse is, you know, the second best just because they're the closest one to the candidate. But maybe in your case, the, the opposite was true. I think Corley was probably your the, the best one to get out there block walking for you. She that was as awesome. good as I was at pulling votes at the door. Definitely. Yeah, it was an equal. 
thing. Um, it's, it's so we'd actually count it as a candidate door walked if she was actually there. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I mean, you know, when I think about the you know, the ways to run a campaign, I, you know, there's a lot of different ways to have have spouses involved. And you know, having talked to you know, Matt Kraus and Jonathan Stickland, and now yourself, you know, all three of y'all have wives that are that are really involved, but each in very different ways. And you know, Corley is the one that I, you know, at least from my perspective, has been the most involved in the actual running of the campaign. Uh, you know, part of that probably has been that they've, you know, during their earlier political life, they've had more children, and so the, their wives have you know, done a lot more with with them and had other responsibilities. But it's kind of interesting just getting to know a bunch of you guys and seeing the different ways that wives are involved. And I think it's really important for the listeners to know that there is no cookie cutter there; that it's really, truly what works best for y'all and what what makes you both most comfortable, what you're best at, and it, it, so, it sounds like just from knowing the two of you guys that it was a it was a pretty clear the way that she would be most useful and really enjoyed helping the most. Oh yeah, absolutely. She, she was in there on everything. <laughs> That's awesome. She, she's really cool. And for anybody that gets to, gets to meet her, this listing, she's, she's a rock star and uh, way, way cooler than Matt is, <laughs> which is yeah. the same thing as my, my wife's but way cooler than I am. So I, I understand that, <laughs> uh, that situation. Now you mentioned block walking and, and folks who listen to the podcast know this is, these are like my favorite words, definitely my favorite campaign activity. Uh, talk about how you said that that's something you didn't do in your first race. It's, you know, the vast majority of your focus in the second race. What was it that kind of led to you seeing that shift or that shift in your opinion on the subject? Luke, uh, Macias, <laughs> I, I, I had a different consultant in my first race too. And, um, we didn't really emphasize it <clears throat> was kind of saying, you know, you can wait till later to do it and everything. So by the time I got it done, um, I got about probably, 1200 houses, maybe a thousand by the end of the race. Um, I had spent a lot of time trying to raise money. And to be honest, I had to put in a lot of my own money for the first race. The money didn't come when I wasn't block walking. Um, it was harder to find volunteers. Uh, and it was, you know, I'd spend a lot of my time on the phone, just trying to call people and raise money. Um, the second race, Luke had me block walking more. I enjoyed doing it. I hated raising money and talking to strangers and asking them for help like that. Um, and I just block walked all day. And I said, you know, forget it. If I raise the money, I raise the money. If I don't, I don't. At least I'll block walk. And I walked to four or 5,000 houses by the end of the campaign. Um, basically hit my whole voting base uh, in the off-year election. And to be honest, I didn't have to put any of my own money in that race because the enthusiasm was so high because everybody, you know, kind of knew me by that time that I raised the money. Um, so it was a completely different campaign. It was like the, everything else trailed off of the block walking and the money, the enthusiasm, the volunteers. When I was block walking, all of that was high. When I was focused on the other things, it wasn't. So that's that's pretty cool. And I think something a lot of people don't anticipate it in a way it's counterintuitive, but, but you're saying that what you saw is that by block walking the relationships and the contact you were having really fed a fire there that then all of a sudden the people you're talking to and the people they're sharing your information with are now saying, man, this is somebody I want now that I know him, now that I've seen him out and seen him working hard and got to talk to him. I want to volunteer. I want to raise money. I want to donate mm -hmm. to that. You're saying, you're saying that followed the block walking and really helped fuel that second campaign. Absolutely. And even the people outside of the district, too, who are, uh, I, I guess, in smoke filled rooms in Austin trying to figure <laughs> out what the race is going to be, um, they're doing polling. So that block walking showing up in their polling and when, you know, the conservative groups are looking, going, oh, this race is close. Then all of a sudden you do get more more money from uh, the conservative donors. And that leads to to bigger, better things. I think when, you know, here in Texas, we've had multiple cycles in a row where we had between 20 and 30 or so conservative campaigns that were, you know, were in cycle that were, you know, we had good people running and they were, we we're contesting seats. And so when you're looking at that, you know, if you're a donor or really anybody that's interested in helping, you know, you got to decide where is my, where are my resources best put. And the activity when it comes to block walking is one of the most tangible ways to, to measure that. And I know a number of donors here in Texas and, and PACs and stuff, they monitor carefully what campaigns are doing door to door in order to help them figure out, Hey, who's working hard because we want to be a force multiplier and we can't lift them by them by ourselves, but we can help put them over the top if they're putting in the shoe leather. Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, I mean, what's also nice is it insulates you against the negative attacks that inevitably come, especially if you're against an incumbent that has a ton of money. Yeah. 
just kind of you know balance each other out at a certain point if you don't know the people. Yeah, well, I mean, I I even had <laughs> I even had more of an onslaught. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, my my opponent had raised almost a million dollars. I think it was like eight hundred thousand dollars, and I had about seventy five of non in kind uh, actual donations to spend the whole race. So it was just withstanding an onslaught of two or three weeks of just just saturation. I mean, there were three ads per hour, every radio station. Uh, there was there were ads on TV constantly. We could we didn't even watch TV for three weeks. Gosh, I mean, they they had a Super Bowl ad <laughs> in the local oh, wow in the local uh, ad buys during the Super Bowl. Uh, that's how that's how much money they spent on on trying to trying to trash me and uh, the block walking insulated against that. Well, and for folks that are, that are not from Texas that may not understand how big a deal it is, uh, TV ads, even in metro areas for state house campaigns, are not very common. They're not usually a great or a great use of money, but in this case, his opponent had so much of it that not only was it a good use of money, it was about the only way they could spend it all. And so they were able to just saturate things, which is pretty unheard of. I don't know of another campaign where on state house level they've done that. Yeah, and a lot of it had to do too with the fact that they didn't know they were in trouble until late. I know in in December they were they thought I was in the race just to try to pay off my campaign debts from the previous race, and they didn't know how much I was block walking because I stayed <laughs> out of the stayed out of my opponent's area until the end. So by the time all the polling came back, they had no idea why it was really close. And then tried to make a bunch of ad buys, but the cable TV stuff was already sold out, so they ended up buying network. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, and and that was a, that was a crazy election cycle too. Uh, it was it was kind of unclear. We, we figured we'd have high turnout, but with with Trump and Cruz both being on the ballot and a, and a hot active national primary for president, it we our turnout. I know in some cases was two hundred percent of normal, even for a presidential year. Oh and yeah, that was my real up. election though. This is the the first time oh, yeah, when yeah. I was outspent. That was oh, the okay. fourteen election. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So we had about eight thousand people vote in that primary. In the presidential primary, we had about double that. You're right. Yeah, man, eight thousand. So, so you got less than four thousand votes, and you spent a million bucks. <laughs> That's quite a bit per vote. <laughs> they yeah. had to make some kind of record. It was very interesting. Gosh, yeah, that. <laughs> I won by ninety two votes actually. Oh man. Gosh, I, I've uh, told the story frequently, but I, I the first campaign I ever helped out on, I was 12 or I was 10 years old and we lost by 12 votes. And uh, you definitely don't want to be on the far on the other side of that that margin. You want to know you did everything you can. And I was I remember seeing you squeak that one out. And that was that was wild. I did not think it was going to. Well, we had like five precincts left at midnight to report. And I remember I was up 20 votes, but four of the five precincts were in my opponent's hometown that he was winning 60-40. Oh. So I was, I, I thought we had lost. I already told my wife we lost, and then they came back on election <laughs> day. It was actually, I had more votes than he did in those precincts. So I don't know what happened. He got his people out early, I guess. Man, and that, one of those things that we've seen in some cases is just that momentum. And some of it comes from that heavy get out the vote block walking is, you, yeah. you know, your, your name ID is increasing and you're seeing more, you're seeing more and more people that are making decisions late and, and you get that bump. I, I know we had um, this in this election that just was just passed in, uh, in one of the congressional races, uh, Dan Crenshaw, he's running um, for Ted Poe's open seat mm-hmm. and they were, he he squeaked past Kathleen Wall that spent like five million dollars in the yeah. primary, and the way their early voting numbers were way lower than theirs, but they just crushed the uh, their election day, and they just had that momentum building. Uh, Chip Roy, very similarly, down in the CD twenty one open seat, you know, he did well during early voting, but he absolutely crushed it in election day, and it was all you know, momentum building straight through. It's it's part of why, uh, much like a much like a sprinter. Uh, you know, on the track, you can't just because you you're getting close to finish line or even crossing it, you can't let up. You gotta your your the stop point or when you let up is like ten yards past the finish line because you don't want any break in momentum in those last couple of strides. Yeah. All right, so we talked about the block walking a little bit about what that's important. You know, as as you look at that, you know, your experience running for state house and running for judge and, and all the different experience that built up to to winning in fourteen. 
what were some of the the other takeaways you had? I mean, I know that you you talked about having experience with different consultants and some different strategies there with raising money, with block walking. What were some uh, you're thinking to our listeners who are either running for office or considering it or helping run campaigns? What are some of the things that that you learned that might be helpful there? Um, well, I mean, one is choosing the right consultant, um, someone that meshes, someone that's not only skilled, but meshes with your personality. Um, you know, one of the good things about Luke is, is I'm, I'm, I'm always the pessimist and he's always, he's always a good optimist and someone who can reason and reason his optimism fairly well. So, you know, I would, uh, <laughs> I'd call him and the world was ending and he'd be like, Oh, this is the same thing that happened to Stickland a couple of years ago. And, blow, and then I would feel better again and get all revved up and go out and block walk some more. I remember the first election. There was one time when we were, uh, you know, I, I would, my, my consultant would want to, you know, obviously some people, most people are more optimistic and they think everything's great. And the consultant's there to tell them where the pitfalls possibly are. But with me, you know, my wife comes home. I'm in the dark watching Netflix one day. <laughs> the fetal like, position over the walking? couch. I'm like, oh, the world's go over. It's <laughs> over. It's all over. <laughs> so oh you got to find someone who actually fits your personality and motivates you to actually do all this work because it's tough when you're in it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, yeah, a lot of people, they pick a consultant. You know, they look at the win rate. They look at one meeting. But then I don't think they really look at at how intimate a relationship it really is. Especially when you're talking about these kind of races, you're spending a lot of time being influenced by their activity because they're doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, them and their team. But there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of communication in most cases. A lot of those phone calls and text messages, you're having to either build people up or pull them back a little bit, depending on which side that optimism, whether they're more the Eeyore side or, you know, the just bundles of joy and, and really staying focused uh, and you're going from ha- oftentimes having no previous relationship to being in a foxhole with somebody sharing a you know, real intimate relationship. And you know, h- how do you do that? I mean, I think you'd known Luke maybe a little bit beforehand, but talk no, a little about, so prior to, to engaging him, talk about how that relationship grew over time and, and kind of what, what you really liked about that. Well, I mean, I, 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 I didn't really know him before. I think I met him once before I hired him. Uh, during the during the initial race. Um, and when I, you know, when I hired him, I was just impressed with what he did the last election cycle. Um, he, he was more playing to my strengths, I guess. You know, most consultants try to tone you down and get you to say less and be careful of what you're saying. And that really is reflected in the way you govern in a a lot of people, and because that's basically what the U.S. Congress is, right? Yeah. A um, bunch of people trying to temper their actual beliefs and, and look reasonable in public. What One thing I was good about Luke and was a good fit is one of my strengths is being able to talk boldly in a way that makes sense. Um, and, you know, that was one of the things he would encourage. And with the knowledge that, you know, sometimes when you do that, you're going to slip up or, you know, there'll be a little media outcry or something like that once in a while. But... Overall, it's who you are and it's your strength. Yeah, I think making sure that you're able to communicate who you are. I mean, voters typically want somebody that is that is like them, that shares their values, is smarter than them, but doesn't act like it. A piece of advice mm-hmm. Dr. Mark Campbell gave me a while back on one of these episodes. And I think that, you know, especially today when we see so many politicians that, that won't say what they believe and or at least that what they say they believe we can't really trust – that when there's somebody that's willing to to speak boldly, to be themselves, and to not be afraid to to offend somebody just because they're saying what they believe, uh, I think people I think people reward that in many cases. They definitely did with you. I think they do with Stickland, with folks like Briscoe and others that we've seen here in the state. Um, people that are willing to stand for what they believe in, and whether that's what all the voters believe or not, at least they have an option to vote for somebody who's not going to be cowed into submission. They're going to actually try to represent you know their beliefs and their voters. Yeah, I agree. And and one of the things too that you can't underestimate is um, is likability as well. And I, Luke and I always get into discussions over this, uh, where my my theory is that given the same amount of money, the same amount of work, the more like or or even you know comparable amounts of money, comparable amounts of work, the more likable candidates always going to win, regardless of politics and policy. Yeah. And people, I mean. 
we have uh, local candidates here who are so focused on what their platform is going to be. And I try to focus them away from it and say, listen, just keep it simple with the platform. You are going to win the election with your personality. Yeah. It's not going to be that. And it was because after the elections, me and Luke will go down the list and it turns into this thing where I'm trying to look if we're right or wrong. And then we get into these arguments over which of the two candidates in a race is actually a more likable person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to test the theory. So I think you're right. I mean, when you yeah. look at, especially this past election, I think that that bears it out. And I remember uh, Senator Bob Hall, I was talking to him at a dinner a couple months ago, and we were talking about the, the podcast and stuff and wanted to have him on. And he was, he said, well, Raz, remember, tell everybody that it's more and more important that they like you than they agree with you on everything. And that's a hundred percent true because yeah. th- there's nobody that's agree with you on everything. Uh, but I mean, heck, you know, most time we have a hard time agreeing with ourselves on everything. <laughs> We'd change opinions and go back and forth on stuff. But mm-hmm. if someone likes you, if they believe you're somebody that has uh, character in, in your soul, that you have some kind of you know, fixed principles, then they're going to think you're going to do all right most of the time. And that's that's pretty valuable. Plus, frankly, I think that for a lot of people, it's much easier to build the likability factor than try to convince them they agree with you on 90 or even 95% of the issues. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the important thing and people want somebody to listen as well. I mean, I remember we were, we were at the door of one guy. Uh, I was with my wife this time and she just sat and stayed quiet, but I could tell what the look on her face is. The guy exclaimed that he didn't like conservatives. He didn't like Christians and uh, he didn't like uh, re- pro-life Republicans. So I, <laughs> I explained to him, well, I'm more conservative. I am Christian uh, and I am pro-life. But uh, can I get your vote? And he goes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of weird how some people make up decisions about voting. I mean, something like that, as somebody that votes very much based on the principles and the beliefs of who I'm voting for, it blows my mind when I hear stories like that, but it happens every time. And that's, that's, it's one of those things where you would not have got that guy's vote if you hadn't knocked on his door. Yeah. I mean, it does, it doesn't make sense. Some of them. I, I mean, I remember one guy who put my sign in his yard. He was probably one of the more, most liberal, re, liberal Republican primary voters I've ever spoken to. And he put my sign in his front yard with, with his Hillary Clinton sign <laughs> last election. And then uh, for the general election, he was out working the polls for my opponent, my Democrat opponent. But yet he voted for me in the Republican primary and put a sign in his front yard. So wow. none of the, the voting behavior necessarily makes sense. We try to attribute some sort of sense to it. There, there, there isn't always. No. We did a recount one time in a local race which was one of the most eye-opening things to me. Uh, it was in the city of Irving, and you know the the mayor Beth Van Dyne, who a lot of people know as the as the more conservative wing. Um, you know, it aligned with Stephen Jones, who's our, our conservative uh, uh, Irving ISD member, and they had two more liberal opponents, right? So Beth had a liberal opponent, and and. Steve did. Well, Steve and Beth won their elections by comparable percentages. So our view was, oh, we brought out more conservatives. When we did this recount on this other race, uh, you know, you had probably 50 percent of the people voting for Beth and uh, Steve and uh, and Stephen Jones's opponent or voting for Beth's opponent and the conservative for school board. (laughs) So it made no sense whatsoever. None of the ballots when you actually saw the physical ballots. And that's what we're what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, a lot I did. Of people's voting behavior doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I remember back in I guess it would have been in two thousand and uh, two thousand and twelve. Uh, we were doing a bunch of work in the uh, the race. Wendy Davis, you know, she ran for for it was the last time running for the Senate seat before before Connie got that seat. And in the debt general election, you had Romney on the ballot, and you had Craig Goldman as a state rep candidate. And there were so many, there was a significant number of people who voted for Romney at the top and they voted for Wendy Davis, the Democrat for state Senate, and then they switched back. And that pattern, you know, virtually never happens. You might have somebody that would vote, you know, and switch, but they don't switch back. That's just hardly ever heard of. But, you know, in their case, they, you know, there are a lot of local folks that just felt like they knew Wendy and she was a local girl, so they vote for her. And, in spite of the fact that her values were, you know, 180 degrees off from Goldman or Romney. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, how does that make sense? But a lot of people went for it. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's my, my district. Hillary Clinton won my district by eight points last election, and I won by two. So I polled probably three or 4,000 Hillary Clinton voters. I have no idea who these people are. <laughs> Don't you just want <laughs> to meet, meet these people at some point and just be like, why? Why? <laughs> yeah. I know. That'd be and and it would, even in the primary that happened as well, it was the same election that Don Huffines and John Corona were going at it pretty heavily. And Don Huffines' best area in my district was my worst area. Yeah, we would campaign together. Wow. So in, uh, in Don Huffines' bad area, there were all of these houses with John Corona, Matt Rinaldi sign pairings. And Don would come to the door and just be like, why? Like, well, we like Matt, we like John. <laughs> wow. I, I think one of the lessons there is, you're know, talking about all these weird yard sign pairings, is just because you see somebody that you know doesn't align with you or even your opponent sign in somebody's yard, don't just chalk it up as a lost vote. You know, Make the effort to at least go introduce yourself because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, half the time. I mean, I, I went to... Uh, doors with my opponent's sign on it. And we're like, oh, well, he came to the door and I just said he could put a sign. You can put a sign up too. So then they have <laughs> both both opponent signs in the front yard. <laughs> yeah. It, it's weird what happens, but yeah, I definitely, one of the nice things you do know, one of the things you know for sure is that at least folks who have a sign out are, they're willing to put out signs and they might be a little bit more engaged than normal. And are mm -hmm. they're at least willing to, to put something out there. So go talk to them, at least introduce yourself. And if they're fixed on the other guy, you know, you just being kind and sharing a little bit of information about yourself and, and telling them to have a good day might at least soften any uh, boogeyman view that the other guys gave them of you. Yeah, maybe they won't talk to all their friends or yeah. be motivated to make an extra phone call right. if you weren't that bad. So, so you you won these heavily contested races. Uh, it's it's been crazy. Your your race is is shaping up to be probably one of one of the most competitive general election races here in Texas on the state house mm -hmm. level. Um, it's probably the one that's that's going to be closest, or just as far as how the numbers are shaping up. Uh, you know, when you look at that, you know, we'll get to talking about the, your t tenure in the legislature here in a moment. But you know, when you look at that, um, you know, not asking for any secret sauce here, but you know block walking seems to be a key part of what you're trying to do. You know, what are the main, the main things that you want to, to show your district and that you're going to be trying to communicate to them? You mean policy wise or uh, just, camp, just out of the campaign, but whether it's policy, whether it's personality, you know, what are the different things about you that you want to communicate? I mean, I think you want to want, want to meet as many people as possible personally. So they know that you're available and that you listen, uh, whether you agree with them or not. I think that's very important. Um, and a lot of reps don't do it. Uh, they don't meet with everybody who asks. That's what I, I mean, I do. If, if you ask to meet with me, I'll, I'll schedule a personal meeting with you. Some people say, I actually don't even do many, I've done two town halls, I think. I don't do many town halls and people ask why is it because I personally meet with every single person who asks. Yeah. <laughs> so I do individual town halls. Um, <laughs> so I think that's very important in terms of issues. Now I, I, you know, I, I try to, I'm obviously a conservative. I motivate the conservative base. Um, but there's a lot of issues that are really bipartisan that are at the at the front of the governor's agenda and, and the Republican agenda, like property taxes. Everybody's concerned with high property taxes. And I think that's going to be one of the one of the main issues uh, that as well as education, uh, school finance and and the like. So, I, you know, I think the issues come very easy and I think they favor Republicans in the general. So as you're looking at this campaign as shaping up, uh, you know, one of the things that I always ask candidates, I think one of the most important you know, sets of questions that I, I see in every race is three whys. It's like, why, you know, why you're running, uh, why you're running now, and why is this office the one that you seek? And I'd love to kind of get a little bit, you know, a little bit of feel from you about, you know, what your why is as far as you, you're now, this is, uh, so what's your, you're running for your fourth term. Is that right? Third third term run for your third term i can't count apparently and so and you're still motivated to go through this meat grinder again and you got a you know, young son at home got a wife at home you have your business you know why do you want to do this why is this worth it for you well i mean obviously it's it's the young son at home and the type of world he's going to inherit um you know texas has been so extraordinarily successful in um in promoting a, a vibrant economy and creating jobs and in, in, in 
expanding economic growth more than any other state in the country the last 10 years. And we've attracted so many more new people to Texas, but um, you know, we wanna make sure that continues into the future. And likewise, we wanna make sure that um, you know, the, the culture that made us America continues into the future. And, you know, I want my son to grow up in, in, in a country that values justice, personal responsibility, um, strength. Uh, and I, I see that those values are under attack right now. So I think it's there's no greater time that I would want to be in office. Um, and in fact, this office is so much more important because I, I, I see the federal government as not being the source of any movement in policy at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Congress is two thirds of the government uh, is on autopilot. Congress seems to be going along with the motions. Most of our laws come from the administrative state. So in the state level, we pass more bills than Congress do. We affect more policy, I think, than Congress does here in Texas and locally. And, you know, one one person or a group of 12 people, as we saw last election, can affect so much. Um, there's no other office you can affect this much. So I, I think, you know, the time it is and the amount of policy you can affect, I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Well, I definitely appreciate the kind of the kind of work you're willing to do there. Uh, you know, some people may not be aware, but it's pretty much an unpaid position. And it takes a lot of your time. You got 140 days at least every other year. Then you got all the campaign time. You got the the time meeting with constituents one on one, like you do. And uh, all the while, you got to you know feed your family and got to do the things you got to do to to be a good dad. And uh, we got we're we're blessed with a lot of great people. Um, you know, many of your friends in the state house and state senate and elsewhere here in Texas, just public servants across the country who are willing to do that. And I think that you know what I hope is that we'll see more and more men and women of principle who actually believe something and want to stand up for it, who are going to stand up and, and take on those challenges. And yeah. so I'm excited by that because I'm in the same boat as you, six-month-old son. I'm like, man, we got to do something. I know, <laughs> it's, I know. It's, 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 I thought it was important before, and I'm, now I'm looking around I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> we got to. This I is mean, big. I'm terrified. Even when you're watching cartoons, I mean, some of the stuff they slip into cartoons nowadays, even with the culture hitting you over the head with all, everything. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's going to be, it's going to be a tough life for our kids if we don't do something. I agree. I agree. So let's, uh, let's look at, you know, after you got elected, now you, you've been working for, for several years to get there. You get the votes. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you won 2014 general, you know, with the, with a pretty good margin. And now here we are November of 14 and here in a couple months, you've got to have a functioning office. You've got to learn all the legislative you know, rules and how to get things done and how to not let your bills get killed, where to sit, where the bathrooms are. You get a lot of stuff. In the middle of that, you've got to hire a staff, many, of, many or most of whom you've never met before, mm -hmm. and have a functioning operation that's ready to kick butt for your constituents uh, come the first part of January. How in the world do you do that? Well, your, your consultant helps a lot, <laughs> or at least my consultant helped a lot, um, you know, helped pair me up with a great chief of staff who had um, a lot of experience and, and um, you know, she she basically runs my office day to day, knew everything going on, you know, from the first day. So that was very important to me rather than having a, a chief of staff that didn't have any experience. So I left a lot to her and she was she's one of the best people I've worked with and, you know in my career outside of politics also in a, in a self motivator. So that helped a lot. And then once you're there, you know, I, I mean, I'm a lawyer, so a lot of, a lot of it came easy. And to be honest, a lot of people don't like lawyers in the legislature, but if you are a lawyer, who's a conservative, it does make it easier to catch on and the learning curves less because, you know, the, the skills involved in, you know, doing a committee hearing is basically, you know, being an appellate judge on a panel. It's it's the same thing. You're questioning. You're trying to get the truth of the matter. Um, questioning someone from the back mics, like cross examination, um, laying out a bill is like, you know, basically laying out an appellate argument. So the the learning curve on a lot of these things was a little less just because I had done it as a litigator. But yeah, still overwhelming when you're in the Capitol. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right being the center of attention. So, you know, the first session, the, the rules you can read, but you're not really understanding it until you've actually gotten through it. So, um, you know, the first session I think was, was great. I think as a freshman, I, I, I got the hang of it, you know, more than most freshmen do, but still, I think the second session was when 
we actually, you know, started getting our footing and strategically started using the rules to our advantage to, to form, to change policy. And as part of that, you know, within the conservative wing of the Republican, Republican Party, you know, you guys and the Freedom Caucus folks like you know, Krauss and Matt Schaefer and Stickland have, have been in the majority party, but really in a minority position because the Democrats often work with the more liberal Republicans to to keep the conservative reforms from happening there in mm-hmm. the state house. And, and here's crossing fingers that we have a different situation with a new speaker next cycle. But, you know, that's what it's been like for the last couple of years. One of the things that I'm always a big fan of is is looking at the procedural side of of legislating and especially your strategic ability to to kill bad things or to use the rules to to really influence the broader picture. You know, look at the full board type thing. And that's something that, that I feel like you guys really crushed it at this last cycle uh, in this last session. And it kind of culminated with with the local consent calendar um, <laughs> and, and you guys having a showdown there. Talk, talk a little bit about what was at stake, why you guys chose to do something that ticks so many people off, and, and what that actually accomplished. Because I think it's a, a pretty cool story. I think it did a lot of good. Well, we started, um, I mean, I mean, there, there were a few times where things came to a head and since we don't have influence over what comes to the floor of the house, a lot of it has to do with just, um, using leverage against the people who do have control over what comes to the floor of the house. And one of the pieces of leverage we had was being able to kill bills on local and consent calendar, which by the way, it creates a huge issue, um, you know, with with lobbyists who have clients who are interested in stability and, and the speaker himself is interested in stability um, because that's what he touts as a moderate. Right. He mm-hmm. wants to be reasonable. He wants to be stable and he wants to be a statesman. Well, if you've got people that are able to disrupt the proceedings, well, that doesn't really work out for him. That no. Um, so his his big I guess his he pushed back on us, basically saying, you know, you don't have the guts to do this. And <laughs> we said, oh, au contraire, <laughs> we will kill 200 bills regardless of content unless you. Uh, and, and actually, I think that the ask was pass some of the younger guys, Freedom Caucus members, local bills and pass my church security bill um, or we're, or we're going to kill the, the local and consent calendar. Um, he said you wouldn't dare. We did. And it became the Mother's Day massacre. And incidentally, <laughs> by the way, after that happened, the chair of the calendars committee realized that she doesn't really have a committee if we kill all her local bills. So she started putting our members' bills on local and consent calendar after that. And I passed my church security bill anyway as a rider on another bill. So the speaker got nothing out of that whole thing other than basically hurting himself and increasing our power in the chamber. Well, and what you guys did there is for folks that may not be aware, you basically took some, you know, stuff that had to get passed and that everybody wanted to get past it. Non-content wise, nobody really disagreed on. And so that's what the local consent calendar is made up of. Basically, non, you know, typically non-controversial and some must-pass legislation that nobody gets their panties in a wad about. And because the, the speaker and the calendars committee had said, basically, screw y'all, we're not going to, if your name's on it, we're not going to touch it. Um, you were, you went to them and said, look, uh, well, we're willing to do this. You know, we're, we're willing to shoot the hostage. And they said, you wouldn't dare. You called the, they, you called their bluff and that forced some major changes that, that you got a lot of good stuff out of it. There's a lot of people that got ticked about it, but fundamentally you were standing up for the people you represented and the principles you said you believed in. And he said, look, if this is a tool at our disposal and we don't have another way of accomplishing these things, and then we got to. Yeah. I mean, if the, and truly, if those bills were that important also, they would have gotten passed by the Senate. And a lot of the Senate versions did get passed and, and the important stuff eventually did. Um, but, yeah, that's exactly what we did. And it was interesting because later that night we ended up having the filibuster, which had nothing to do with the original killing of the local bills, but actually was quite a bold move after we had already done that. So later on that night, um, you know, there were a lot of bills that the speaker was holding up that the lieutenant governor had already passed. And there's a continuation of government bill that we have to pass every legislative session uh, called the Sunset Safety Net, which basically it continues agencies like the Texas Medical board that we needed an extra two years. Um, at about nine o'clock, 
at the deadline to pass House bills was was midnight, we discovered that that was that bill was six bills away. And if we killed that bill, it would put power in the lieutenant governor's hands to basically force a special session by not passing the Senate sunset safety net. And so that's then you guys filibustered and you forced a special session as a result. Yeah, an, an impromptu. Well, we allowed. Yeah, we allowed uh, Gov- Lieutenant Governor Patrick to, to force a special session, which a three hour impromptu filibuster when it usually takes five minutes to pass a bill. So we would have gotten through that in probably 20 minutes. Um, we had a stall for three hours and we were talking about some trade school teacher licensing bill. Um, <laughs> and, and nobody knew what we were doing and we couldn't tell them because that would hurt our ability to, to kill the bill we wanted to kill. So everybody was looking at us. They thought this was a continuation of the, the killing of the local bills and we were doing it just to be jerks basically. <laughs> um, they turned up the heat in the house chamber to 85 degrees. Oh Everybody was looking at us. I've never gotten looks like this before in my <laughs> life. It was the most uncomfortable I've ever been. And people don't realize that when you're going through it, you don't know the result, right? So no. we could have gotten to the point where they actually passed the bill and all this was for naught and we look like idiots. <laughs> yeah. So it's a huge risk of doing this. And it's certainly not guaranteed. I mean, I remember talking to turn over to Stickland with like 10 or 15 minutes left to go. And I said, we're like one or two bills away. I'm going to fake a heart attack if I need to. <laughs> like, and I looked at him, I'm like, I'm seriously hitting the floor, clutching my chest. So <laughs> just to let you know, <laughs> call the paramedics act surprised. <laughs> I'm like, I, I mean, because the, the, the thought of failing after doing this for three hours in the spotlight, you know, is, is, is just unthinkable. So it, it was very interesting. <laughs> I can tell why why so many legislators don't want to want to go about it that way, just because it's 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 risky personally. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you you run the risk of looking stupid. You know, there were plenty of people that that were angry with you for doing that, for forcing a special session. But at in, at the end of the day, the things that you were sent down there to get done weren't getting done. And so yeah. you have these rules, you have these ways of maneuvering that are there. You got to use them. And that's where you know, your legal background, I imagine, was very helpful in understanding the rules. That's why having chiefs of staff and staffers that understand the rules, understand parliamentary procedure, that can be very, very helpful. Because you know, whether it's looking for points of order, whether it's trying to make sure that you're not going to get you know, PO'd, or looking for ways to kill stuff that are you know, relatively novel, uh, those are all ways of getting the job done for your constituents that, that few people yeah. take advantage of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's you, you got to do what you I, that's all that I think the voters want when they're frustrated with Republicans not doing what they said they were going to do. They're frustrated with leadership, but they're also frustrated with the people not in leadership and not doing everything they can to 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 follow through with their campaign promises. Yeah. And they're more worried about when we're talking about worried about getting reelected. It just means you're not willing to sacrifice yourself. And it's kind of like it's kind of like being a running back on a football team and playing like you're scared of being injured. You're mm-hmm. not going to be good. And no. You're not going to perform. <laughs> yeah. You got to so, be willing to take that hit. And just lay yourself out. Your body is a missile. Use it. And that's, yeah. that's the whole ethos of being a running back, <laughs> you know? Exactly. I mean, you have to do it strategically, right? right. I mean, you got to call a play. You got to, you can't just write, but you, you know, you can't be worried about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and the part of the reason this came to mind was there was a, there's a, uh, I was recently made aware of a, of a city councilman that he, he said he was against this bond, but he voted with the rest of the council to put it on the ballot. And that just struck me as, as something that's just, just awful. Cause I was like, look, if you, if you were against this, if you think this would be bad for the city, then you don't vote to allow them to allow it to go up, especially knowing how frequently those things pass and the poor margin mm-hmm. of voters that turn out. It's like use every, if you think it's bad, use every procedural means at your disposal to kill it. Otherwise, you don't really think it's that bad. You'd rather trade off and allow that thing to get through and maintain the sense of camaraderie and unanimity amongst your colleagues. You know, they're voting for it because ostensibly they think it's a good idea or they're cool with it. You voting with them because we're going along with this or allowing something to happen when you have a procedural tool to at least signal your disapproval, I think is just foolish and uh, and yeah, pretty disappointing. It's well, yeah. yeah, it's a cop out. So he's basically saying, oh, don't worry, the voters will take care of it if it's a bad idea. And people do that in the legislature all the time. So they'll have a terrible bill in committee and 
they'll they'll look at it. Oh, I'll vote for it in committee because if it's bad, they'll take care of it in the House floor. And then the people in the House will go, ah, we'll just pass it. And if it's bad, the Senate will take care of it. And then yeah. the Senate will say, ah, the governor will veto it if it's bad. And nobody ever kills this bill and it ends up getting passed because yeah. nobody's willing to take a stand against it because they don't want to upset the author who might vote against their bill. Um, it's kind of nuts. <laughs> yeah, but like you said, it happens every single cycle. Lots of times, as it turns out. Yeah. I think that's one of those reasons where we have to have, you know, when I'm looking at candidates, I want to see somebody has a backup bone and has a set of things they actually believe in and that they're willing to sacrifice for. Because if you're not willing to sacrifice what you believe in, even in the small things, like ticking off an author and having to go to him and say, look, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't believe in this, uh, then you really don't belong in elected office. No. And by the way, this isn't about like compromising, not, not compromising no. ever or being completely uncompromising. It's about getting the best the best compromise or the best result you can. So, I mean, a lot of times what we're doing is, you know, establishing a very aggressive bargaining position mm -hmm. uh, on a particular bill. And, you know, nobody ever got a good, good compromise. If you come in saying, okay, we're going to compromise. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Somehow that's what the Democrats and liberals all, always want us to do that. They, they really push hard in the media to make sure that's, that's our bargaining position coming in. And all too frequently, especially when we look at DC, that's exactly what we do. Yeah. yeah. No exactly. surprise we get such crappy deals. But yeah, I mean, in the, when, when we were doing the sanctuary city bill, too, um, we, we realized we didn't have the votes to make the bill stronger initially. And uh, Representative Schaefer and I, um, you know, we're going to compromise out of to get the best deal we could. The Democrats wanted to play politics and were, were more concerned with putting on a show for some protesters that were coming in. So they rejected our compromise. Because of that, the Republicans got angry and we realized we got the votes because they turned down the, the compromise and we ended up rolling over them um, and passing the strongest sanctuary city bill in the country because of the votes we picked up because they weren't going to compromise. A lot of it's like decisions made on the move like that, realizing what the best result you can get is at any given time and sometimes tactics change. That, that was a fascinating fight. Uh, one that uh, one that you caught more than a little bit of flack over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, but I was that's an example of being willing to compromise and your adversary overestimating their position, and as a result, they lost it all. And yep. they, you know, we got everything that we wanted, and or more than we thought we would, as a result of their miscalculation. And that's yeah. You guys did a really good job because that was a that was a very fast moving situation that really all played out on the floor in a very pretty short period of time, right? Oh yeah, I mean, and and you had a you had to really gauge people changing their mind just based on how they were acting on the floor, um, not in front of the mic, but just in terms of you know when when we realized the speaker looked very perturbed at the Democrats, we realized that he wasn't going to try to whip votes against our amendment anymore, and we realized we could get the votes. And it was it was uh, when they when the Democrats were talking, we were going person to person for all of the votes that we thought might be in question, engaging it. And when we realized we had flipped enough votes because of the Democrats' uh, irrational position, you know, we we knew we could go forward with it, and we did. Man, see that, that in my mind is where that, that's the fun part of legislating, right? <laughs> when you get to get to see things like that happen and get to play it out in real life, that's uh, that's that's pretty cool stuff. I love it. You got a, you got 150 people, different things motivate them. You have 150 different personalities, and that's what you're trying to do is just move votes in your direction. Um, it's it's pretty interesting. Yeah, that, that's that's got to be one of those moments that when you get that thing done, you're like, this is why we came down here. This is why yeah. I'm here. We got so many of that last session. I mean, it's a, Mark Jones from Rice University uh, did a did an analysis of our of our voting records and he does the liberal to conservative. But he mm -hmm. also does an analysis of win rates. Right. So it's the amount of times each legislator was on the winning side of the vote. Um, so naturally, if you know, you'd think Republicans would be on the winning side more than Democrats because you're passing Republican legislation. They found in Strauss's first term, the Democrats were on the winning side about 95 percent of the time and the Republicans wow. significantly less. Even when there was a two thirds Republican majority, the session before I came in, the Democrats were on the winning side of about 95 percent of the votes. The Republicans about 85 percent with the conservative Republicans about 30, 30 to 40. So, uh, the last session, because of what we did, if you look, the Democrats just all dropped down to 40% on the graph. 
and the wow. Republicans, even the conservatives are up over 75 percent with most Republicans being around 90, 95. So everything changed last session. No graph shows what we did last session more than that. We were passed. And keep in mind, this is not eliminating bipartisanship. No. Democrats agreed with 40 percent of the bills, yeah. 40, nearly 50 percent of the bills. But we were passing Republican legislation a significant amount of time. Well, it was definitely the most exciting session that I've got to see since I started you know, working full time in this field back in 09. And yeah. it was it was just a blast to watch you guys. I mean, I, I can't say how many hours I spent with the with the floor committee hearings up, getting to actually enjoy what was going on because I things were happening, stuff that we've been fighting for for you know nearly a decade was actually getting done. I know it was amazing. Pro life bills, best session we've had yeah. since Roe v. Wade. Um, now you know why the Democrats were so angry at us by the last day. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, there was a whole lot of animosity built up over you know 139 days. <laughs> I know we have been winning, we've been beating them so badly over over 139 days, the 140th day. I think everything exploded. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I love the fact that you guys you didn't get weary in the fight because you know, for some of y'all in the Freedom Caucus came in in 2010, a lot more in 12, even more of y'all with your class in 14, and y'all were willing to go and keep going back and keep fighting. And, you know, thankfully that resulted in, uh, it took a couple of years, but you got some incredible stuff done and I'm, I'm excited, you know, hopefully we're going to even have a bigger opportunity in, you know, in 19 next year, um, you know, we send you and the, a bunch of your classmates back. Let's, uh, as we're kind of wrapping up here though, let's, let's shift a little bit. I, you know, I'd love to hear any advice, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our listeners are, are folks that are, that are younger, that are thinking about either helping campaigns want to run. Uh, run their own, want to help as consultants or campaign staff. What are some of the things that they need to be looking at uh, in themselves as well as the people they're working with uh, to to help make sure that they're staying on the right path? And then two, for the candidates, what are what are a couple of things that they can be doing now to prepare for when they eventually pull that trigger? Because that was something you did a lot of good work on, preparing the ground well in advance of actually running for office. Yeah, Um you know, for, for work, campaign workers, people just trying to get into politics and, and for candidates too. I mean, you really have to know, just know what you believe, know what your principles are, because, you know, the way, the way they make moderates into you isn't by, uh, you know, thinking you're shifting your principles. It's by convincing you that the uh, easiest path to take is the right one. And that's often how, you know, people get guided on the wrong path. It's the one that's that's easiest for you. So know your principles and be willing to fight and sacrifice for it, because no part of this is easy at all. And half the time when we're in it during session, um, we're, we're taking the path that's worse for us personally <laughs> and we have to justify it. And it's a tough thing to do. Uh, also, when people are getting involved in uh, elections and campaigns, I say just do it. Just um, the best way to learn is just by doing it. Um, you know, when somebody wants to run for office, most people lose their first time, but they learn so much in doing it. It's just like any job you, you, you learn by doing and the people you'll meet, um, in doing it will be, you know, the people will help you ne you next time. So you just got to get out there and put yourself out there. I love it. Well, and, and we've talked to a number of other folks, like I mentioned, Matt Krause, that he ran that first time he lost, but he learned from it and he won. Uh, you have a very similar story. You talk to folks like Connie Burton that spent years you know, working in the trenches with candidates, helping support them before she ever felt called to run or had the opportunity to do that. Both are great ways to learn a lot about campaigns, to see up close what it takes, and, and to build good relationships with friends you're going to need. And, mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you're in the Dallas area and want to volunteer and get your feet, get your hands dirty that way, you can just go to MattRinaldi.com and uh, he's got a general election coming up. You can uh, you can jump in and help knock some doors with him and his bride. And uh, we'll have we'll have all the information, Matt, for folks to be able to reach out to you and, and sh learn more about you in the show notes. So folks can can uh, can check that out. Uh, any final words for folks? Nope. Uh, just uh just if you're thinking of being a candidate, please, please do it. If you're thinking of being a volunteer, I got lots of lots of spots for you in November. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, one of the biggest targets in the state of Texas, not because my district's the closest, but because of everything we got done last session and how successful we were. I love it. Well, Matt, thanks for what you do. Please, uh, please give your, your bride our thanks as well. I know she's a huge part of keeping you in the fight. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you again soon. Excellent. Thank you. 
please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.